Okay. Here's the last subject, the day that turns your life around. Let me just quickly give you a list of four emotions that can change your life in one day. Emotions are powerful. Sometimes it doesn't take much to alter your whole life direction. Okay, here they are. Number one, disgust. Powerful emotion. Disgust says, I have had it. See, that could be the day. The day you can say, I've had it. And whether you've had it with something small or something major, the day you can say, I've had it, may not be the day it ends, but the day it begins. That's what I said when that little Girl Scout left my door when I'm 25. I give her the big lie, she leaves, I say, I don't want to live like this anymore. I've had it with lying and being broke. Powerful day. The man's finally had it with mediocrity. He's had it with being a loser. He's finally had it with those awful sick feelings inside, knowing his wife is at the grocery store looking at two cans of beans, one mark 37 cents, one mark 39 cents, and the guy sick inside knows his wife's going to buy the 37 cent can and she doesn't even like the brand. Do you know why she's going to buy the 37 cent can? To save two cents. The guy sick inside finally says, I've had it. Being on my knees in the dust looking for pennies, we're not living like this any more. Could be the day that turns your life around. The day you can say, I've had it. He walks into his closet and rips everything in it to shreds and says, I've worn this embarrassing stuff for the last time. And not only will I never wear it again, no one else <laughs> will ever wear it again. Commit an act that says, I've had it. Powerful. Here's the next one. Decision. And decision making is powerful. And it's emotional. That's those knots in the pit of your stomach, right? Waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, trying to decide. We sometimes call it inner civil war. What shall I do? Well, for progress, you must decide. The best advice I can give you came from a wealthy friend of mine who said, if it's easy, do it easy. If it's hard, do it hard. Just get it done. If you went home tonight and in the next few days cleaned up a whole list of decisions, that might furnish enough inspiration for the next 10 years. I found this out. Many times after you've decided, getting on with it is easier than deciding. Sometimes decision is the toughest part. Here's the next emotion, desire, wanting to, bad enough. And I don't know how to tell you to want to. That's something you've got to come up with. There's two things I know about desire. Number one, it comes from inside, not outside. You don't send off for it. Number two, I know desire can be triggered by something. Who knows what it might be? Sometimes desire waits and sleeps for something to happen. Maybe it's a book. Maybe it's a song. Maybe it's a sermon. Maybe it's a lecture, a seminar. Maybe it's the conversation of a friend, a happening, an event. Who knows? The best I can, advice I can give you is what I give my staff, it goes like this, welcome every human experience. You never know which one is going to turn it all on. Even the bad experiences. Sometimes from the bitterest experience comes the greatest awakening. So let down the barriers, take down the walls. 
The same wall that keeps out disappointment keeps out happiness. Let life touch you. Don't let it kill you, but let it touch you. Here's the last one. This one's powerful. Resolve. Resolve says I will. Two of the most powerful words in the language. I will. Benjamin Disraeli once said, nothing can resist a human will that will stake even its existence on the extent of its purpose. Shortly put, I'll do it or die. See, that's powerful. That could be the day that turns your life around. The world has a strange way of stepping aside when somebody says, I'll do it or die. The man says, I will climb the mountain. They've told me it's too high, it's too far, it's too rocky, it's too difficult. It's never been done before, but it's my mountain, I will climb it. Pretty soon you'll see me waving from the top or dead on the side because I ain't coming back. The best definition I ever got from the word resolve came from a little junior high girl in Foster City, California, up north. I'm talking to the junior high kids one day. I love to ask kids definitions. They come up with beauties. I got to the word resolve and I asked, who can tell me what resolve means? And I got several hands and they were all pretty good, but the last one was the best. Little girl, about three rows back, held up her hand. She said, Mr. Rohn, Mr. Rohn, I think I know what resolve means. I said, darling, what do you think it means? She said, I think it means promising yourself you will never give up. I said, that's it. Webster, stand aside. That is the definition. Promise yourself you will never give up. I asked the kids, how long should the, a baby try to learn how to walk? How long? How long would you give your average baby before you shut him off? How long? <laughs> See, any mother in the world would say, you're crazy. My baby's going to keep trying until it learns how to walk. What a magic formula. Now, let me show you what triggers all emotions into activity that brings results. And results is the name of the game. Here it is. Action. Finally, you must do something about how you feel. Jesus, the master teacher, said, don't just be listeners, be doers. The world admires the doers. Whatever it takes to get you to try harder, read more, set your goals, and go for it. Here's the next attitude disease. Overcaution. Some people never will have much. They're too cautious. Now, you can also be too reckless, but you can also be too cautious. This is called the timid approach to life. And my caution was always the risk. Risk used to drive me right up the wall. I used to say, what if this happens? It's called the language of the poor. What if this happens? And on top of that, if this was to happen, look at the fix I'd be in. I better not try. I could always ace myself out. Then I'll tell you what changed my whole life when I finally discovered it's all risky. The minute you were born, it got risky. If you think trying is risky, wait till they hand you the bill for not trying. If you think investing is risky, wait till you get the tab for not investing. See, it's all risky. Getting married is risky. Having children is risky. Going into business is risky. Investing your money is risky. It's all risky. I'll tell you how risky life is. You're not going to get out alive. <laughs> that's risky. The Englishman says, well, if that's the way it's going to work out, let's give it a go. Right. That's what it's for. Give it a go. Somebody says, yeah, but I'm looking for safety and security. Fine, then huddle in a corner. We'll cover you with a sheet, bring you three meals a day. And we'll protect you, feed you, look after you, 
care for you, we won't let anything happen to you, and you'll probably live to be 100. The guy said, well, yeah, I'd live to be 100, but what a way to live. Right. What a way to live safe and secure. Don't ask for security. Ask for adventure. Better to live 30 years full of adventure than 100 years safe in the corner. And see, it's not important how long you live. What's important is how you live. Here's the next attitude disease. We're almost through with this motley list. In fact, we're almost through. Hang on. The next one is pessimism. Pessimism, the deadly disease of always looking on the bad side, the problem side, the difficult side, checking all the reasons why it can't be done. The poor pessimist leads an ugly life. He doesn't try to figure out what's right. He tries to figure out what's wrong. He doesn't look for virtue. He looks for faults. And when he finds them, he's delighted. How ugly. This is the poor guy looks through the window, doesn't see the sunset. He sees the specks on the window. <laughs> and this is the poor guy, right, who rushes up, takes such leave of his senses. This guy rushes up and he says, I've got five good reasons why it won't work. He's so dumb, he doesn't know. All he needs one. He's got five. <laughs> To the pessimist, the glass is always half empty. To the optimist, the glass is half full. Why would the same measure affect people two different ways? Answer, it all depends on how you look at it. Our lives are mostly affected by the way we think things are, not the way they are. The way we think they are affects us most. There's a subject we don't have time to get into tonight called better thinking habits. One of the major things Shove taught me when I met him, he said, poor thinking habits keeps most people poor. Not poor working habits. Most people work hard, but they don't think hard. And Shove taught me that the mind is like a factory, a mental factory. And whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. And that's what builds the economic, social, financial fabric of your life. He quoted me a Bible phrase that says, as you think, so you become. How awesome. When he talked about poor thinking habits, he had me. I used to start the day reading the morning newspaper. I mean, you can believe that or not. I'd get a cup of coffee and read the paper. I'd load up on wars and riots and murders and stabbings and killings and bank robberies and muggings and car wrecks and tragedies. I'd even read the back pages. I seem to like that stuff for some weird reason. I'd load up on all that and then I'd start the day. You can imagine the kind of days I used to have. You walk around on your financial knees. They call you economic peewee. <laughs> The guy says, I want to be a great leader. Wonderful. The first thing we do is follow him to his house. When we get there, we walk in and check his library, number one. Somebody says, well, why check his library? The reason is because what a man reads pours massive ingredients into his mental factory and the fabric of his life is built from those ingredients. You would not believe what some people have got in their house to read. You would not believe. One of the best dressed up words I know for a lot of it is trash. <laughs> Can you imagine dumping a barrel of trash into this mental factory every day and coming out with a rich, dynamic, positive life? It can't be done. You might as well try making a cake with cement. The kids back in Danbury, Connecticut, high school, they're asking me questions one day. I'm talking to the kids. Kids got good questions these days. One of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, how do you build the good life? I said, it's 
simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. Here's how you build anything. Select the right ingredients, keep out the wrong ingredients, and it starts with thought. Everything starts with thought. So you must be wise and careful what you think about because that starts everything. You got to be wise and careful. I asked the kids, what would happen if somebody dropped sugar in my coffee? They said, well, you'd be okay. I said, what if somebody dropped strychnine in my coffee? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct. Lesson one, life is both sugar and strychnine. You got to be careful. I said, what if my worst enemy drops in the sugar? They said, will you be okay? I said, what if my best friend, even by accident, drops in the strychnine? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct. Lesson two, watch your coffee. <laughs> you got to be careful. See, it doesn't matter who hands you the bad stuff. It doesn't matter where you get the bad stuff. It'll still do its damage on your bank account. Wherever you get it. Mr. Schoff gave me one of the greatest phrases when I first met him when he said, Jim, every day stand guard at the door of your mind. How important. Stand guard at the door of your mind. And you decide what goes into your mental factory. Don't let anybody just dump anything they want to in your mental factory because you've got to live with the results. Okay, here's the last disease and we're through with this list. In fact, we're almost through, hang on. The last subject is very brief. The last disease, but this one is deadly. Engage in this one, indulge in it even slightly and you might as well forget the future because it's gonna forget you. Complaining, crying, whining, griping, a Bible word called murmuring. See, that'll ace your future. Spend five minutes complaining and you have wasted five. And you may have begun what's known as economic cancer of the bone. Surely they will soon haul you off into a financial desert and there let you choke on the dust of your own regret. I hope I said that well, so you won't forget. It's a deadly disease. If you don't think it's bad, ask the children of Israel of Old Testament fame. Typical of us all, their story just happened to get in the book. Story says, children of Israel were slaves. God performed a series of dazzling miracles and got them out. And now they're heading for the promised land. Remember the story? Heading for the promised land. Tragedy of the story, they never got there. Reason. From day one, they started to complain. They griped about the water. They griped about the weather. They whined and cried and griped about the food. They griped about the leadership. They whined and cried because it was too far, too cold, too hot, too difficult, too miserable. I mean, they whined and, whined and cried for years. Finally, God said, I've had it, trip canceled. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> the story says they died in the desert, never got to the promised land. Which I think means two things. Indulge in this long enough, you get your future canceled. And I guess it also means even God himself can only take so much. Just be on the lookout of the things that can destroy all the good you start. The war is on. And this evening, tomorrow, mentally, personally, socially, economically, you've got to make sure you're winning the war. And this is part of it. 